All right, gentlemen, I think we need to start. And uh, one of the great mathematicians which we are going to encounter today is Henri Poincaré. And just as a, an aside, I wanted to read a short passage from his uh, biography. Poincaré was in uh, 1910 and 11, a fashionable scientist attracting the mundane Paris crowd to listen to him. During the first lecture, the room was more than full, but rapidly and happily, the crowd soon decreased. From the third lecture on, only a few students and few of the avid remained. So I think some of you might understand why I read, read the quote. So, um, so in some sense, I'm not particularly disappointed. It happened to Plato, if you remember. It happened to Poincaré. And who am I to avoid such fate? So, um, OK. Um, the last lecture, we, we sort of seemingly finished with GCD. We did general Euclid GCD. I introduced you to all kind of abstract algebraic setting for it, and then we discussed Stein algorithm. But the story is not yet over. As a matter of fact, I need two more lectures to get us to the sort of the end of this journey. And the important fact is that there is a remarkable mathematical theorem which is intimately connected with GCD and also of great practical utility. And it's called Bizu's identity. What it says that if you have A and B, and again, let's restrict ourselves to this thing called Euclidean domain. Remember, ring where we could handle Euclid algorithm. Then there exist X and Y such that xA plus yb is going to be GCD. That is, we could get a GCD as a linear combination of A and B, right? which is a wonderful, wonderful thing, as we shall see. Uh, of course, uh, it's named after somebody who didn't invent it. It's a very typical mathematical convention that if you have a theorem, you name it after somebody who didn't invent it or who invented 200 years after it was first introduced. Bizu was a very capable French mathematician who in 18th century proved this result for polynomials. However, the first appearance of this result was, proving, was proved almost 200 years before by a remarkable person of whom you absolutely must know. Well, just look at this picture. I mean, he's clearly a worthy guy to, to know. Okay, this is his full name, which nobody ever knows. People just say Bache, Bache. And um, he was one of these great French Renaissance scholars. Sort of, it's, Renaissance is over in Italy, but in France, they're still sort of trying to, to absorb these ideas. And he's truly a Renaissance man a brilliant scholar of Latin and Greek, writes classical commentary on Ovid, a great Roman poet. His poem, Metamorphoses, are highly recommended as the source of knowledge of Greek mythology. And very, very entertaining, beautiful poem. Uh, for those of you who want to read it in English, there is a, in my opinion, remarkable translation by uh, Mandelbaum. Alan Mandelbaum, an American poet. So uh, in any case, this fellow Bachet is a great classical scholar. But he's also very interested being a Renaissance man. You know the term. He's interested in all kinds of things. Therefore, he also wants to know mathematics. And of course, he wants to know Greek mathematics. And people already by that time sort of translated Euclid and commented on Euclid, so that's old hat. It was done 20 years ago. So 
What he needs to do is to find something else which is of great significance. And he finds a great book on number theory by the Greeks called Diophantus Arithmetic. We talked about it a little bit before. And he translates it from Greek into Latin, beautiful Latin, with extensive commentaries and publishes it. And they say, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is there is another guy who buys this book and writes marginal notes. Remember marginal notes written by Pierre de Fermat? They were written on this translation of Diophantus. So one of the great sort of debts we owe to Bachet is that he starts this line of research which started with Fermat, sort of with sort of Fermat would, would be unthinkable without the work by, by Bachet. But there is another thing he did. And this is right now viewed with slight disdain. People say, oh, it's not really that important. He invented a field, which is a wonderful, wonderful field, called recreational mathematics. Right? Some of the older people here might remember Martin Gardner who wrote these brilliant columns in Scientific American. It all was invented by Bachet. He wrote a remarkable book of mathematical amusements, pleasant problems, okay? which sort of starts this thing. And sadly enough, it's not translated into English. But there is a compensating thing. There is a relatively modern book, late 19th century. Uh, which is a moral equivalent of Bachet's book, which I highly, highly recommend. It's called Mathematical Recreations and Essays by Rouse Ball. Right? And especially if you have children and you want your children eventually to sort of develop intellectually and not just play video games, it's a very good book to have, but also for yourself. It's, you know, I have it, I, you know, sort of periodically lose, give it to someone, but then I buy another copy. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful book to have. And the field of recreational mathematics is very important. It led to many great discoveries, and there are some famous people now who did a lot of work on this field. You might have heard of a certain fellow called Donald Knuth. He is very much into that. For example, one of the things what, which was introduced by Bachet in this book is this algorithm for magic squares. You know magic squares? Things which are. So again, Knuth is a great modern specialist on magic squares. And there is another profound reason for taking it seriously. You see, we never know what is game and what is practical. Sort of the idea, we'll be talk, uh, talking about it a little later, the idea is that we could just say, oh, this is important for the search engine. We need to study it. You don't know what's important for the search engine. You really don't. So for all I know, one of the problems <laughs> in this uh, uh, Rouse Ball's book might be of crucial importance. For, so I don't know which one, otherwise, you know, I'll run to Brian, he would listen. But, uh, you know, I don't know. Right? But, what is remarkable, but that's the book where Bachet introduces this wonderful identity, which tells you that. GCD could be obtained as a linear combination of uh, uh, two numbers. GCD of two numbers could be represented as a linear combination of two numbers. Right? Uh, now I have to talk about something which is near and dear to everybody's heart, ideals. We all should have ideals. And mathematicians have ideals too, but they are very specific ideals. They are certain subset of rings. And again, uh, what I'm going to do here, let me sort of preempt, 
I'm going to do a slightly sort of first I will prove that these numbers exist. I'm going to show you using abstract algebra a proof that there is a linear combination. But I'm not going to show you how to get this linear combination. It's not going to be a constructive proof. But it will show you the structure of the space. And then we will derive an algorithm. So that's, that's my evil design. So what is an ideal? Ideal is a subset of a ring. Remember a ring? Sort of, what is the best example of a ring? Integers, right. Now, something like integers. And the subset of integers, which first is closed under addition. Right? So if there are two, it's two things there, or if there is one thing there, this thing plus the same thing has to be the part of the ideal. So if number Four is part of our ideal. Number eight must be the part of our ideal. By the first axiom, it's closed under addition. And then it's sort of, this is a little bit tricky. It's simple. It's closed by multiplication by any element of the ring. Not just by element of an ideal. Yes, that too. But by any element of the ring. Right. What are good examples of ideals? Even numbers. This is, again, sort of observe. Two even numbers, you add them together, you get an even number. You agree, right? Then if you multiply even number by whatever you like, like by seven, still get an even number. Everybody agrees, right? So, and there are, of course, other ideals of integers, yeah? For example, numbers divisible by 5, right? So, but there are many other interesting ideals. For example, polynomials with root 5. Because we take polynomials, two polynomials, if one has a root 5, meaning its value is 0 at 5. Another has root 5. You add them together, whatever they are, whatever their degree, that's root 5. Now, if you multiply a polynomial by any other polynomial, even very big one, still will have root 5. It's not going away. Right? So polynomials with root 5. And then this is, you say, what? Well, that's a weird example. We will need it. So I just want to in introduce this example. Polynomials with x and y's, two variable polynomials, not without free coefficient, right? Because again, if you had two of them, you don't, you're not going to get a free coefficient, right? It's not going to be some combination of x and y, it's plus seven. Right? And if you multiply such thing by anything, it's still going to be of this form. It's a very, very important ideal, as we shall see, it plays a, central role in abstract algebra, as we shall see, to prove something. Now, these are examples of sub-rings which are not ideals. Because people, some people say, well, ideal is like a sub-ring. Yes, of course it is like a sub-ring. But it's more than a sub-ring. For example, Integers constitute a subring of Gaussian integers, right? But they're not an ideal. Why are they not an ideal? Anybody know? We multiply by i, and we don't get an integer, right? So the second axiom does not hold. Of course, the first axiom will always hold in a subring. Subring has to be closed under addition, right? But Again, polynomial over one variable is a subring of polynomial over two variables. But it's not an ideal. Why not? Multiply by y. Right? So this, this is just to, to show you, again, 
Now, now we're getting to something which uh, you need to do at home. You have to prove this takes about two seconds each. So, you prove that it's closed under subtraction. Don't say how, but is it self-evident or not? It is self-evident. Prove that it contains zero in your ideal. Is it self-evident? Well, it's closed under subtraction, yeah? I'm not saying, but... <laughs> so, but try to think about it yourself. If it's not self-evident now, it is self-evident. Now, first of all, just something which we will need just to show that we are getting to what, what we need to do, that if we have a ring for any two elements, A and B, the set of elements which are linear combination is an ideal. Well, you know, this is, this is one of the things where the proof is usually written as obvious or trivial. I mean, indeed, if you have two linear combinations, you add them up, you get linear combinations. Just for those of you who don't believe in proofs where you just say trivial. And it's closed under multiplication. Right? So that's how you prove. So this linear combination in general constitute an ideal. Right? Now, you have to prove this is a gain. You could prove it even now. If you cannot prove it now, you could try to prove it at home. That any linear combination of two numbers is divisible by any divisor of these two numbers. Well, again, it's, you could actually say, well, it's trivial. Uh, yes, it is. Ideals are in Euclidean domains. Remember Euclidean domain? The Euclidean domain allows us to do Euclid algorithm. And what it has, it has this quotient and remainder operation. And remain and as a function norm, where remainder strictly decreases the norm when you apply it. That's why Euclid algorithm will terminate. Right? So any ideal in Euclidean domain is closed under the remainder. Well, here I will have to rely on one of the homework problems, which is. It's closed under the remainder because remainder is A, and A is an our ideal, yes? Then quotient times B. By the second axiom of the ideal, this is part of the ideal, yes? Therefore, the difference is in the ideal. And closed under GCD. And here I just couldn't resist immediately follows from one. Why? Because how do we do GCD? We apply remainder till it becomes zero. So any intermediate remainder, including GCD, is going to be part of the ideal. Okay? It's actually simple, guys. It's, you know, I'm not hiding complexity or anything. There is no complexity. Now, OK, we have some people called principal engineers. And they have principal ideals. They aspire to great things. That's what they are. No. So, uh, and then there are senior principal ideals. These are ideals to which senior principals aspire. So, uh, so, what is a principal ideal? Principal ideal is an ideal which is generated by one element. Like even numbers, is it a principal ideal? Yes. What element generates all members? Two. Numbers divisible by five. Right? So some people say, well, aren't all ideals principal? No. Not every engineer, as we know, is a principal engineer. Therefore, not every ideal is no, it, the proof is a little bit different. So the examples of principal ideals. And that's an example. Remember this weird guy? 
he is not a principal ideal. He is just not. Because guys like that cannot be generated by x. Because things generated by x will include right? And then it cannot be a thing generated by y. So it's not, it's not a principal ideal. Because y cannot be generated by x, and x cannot be generated by y. That's, that's the sort of basic explanation. I mean, they, they are independent, right? It cannot happen, sort of, what's the intuition? Where we're sort of heading. Well, if you have GCD, then you would take GCD, if you have Euclid's algorithm, you'll do GCD, and that will be the generating element. But there is no Euclid does not work for guys like that. Therefore, we cannot find greatest common divisor of x and y. OK, this, this is like trivial. But uh, if everything is generated by this element, then everything is divisible. You have to think one second. So what is a principal ideal domain? And you're going to see it in many algebra books. People say PID. And that's how you, you, you show that you are somebody or other. You say PID, you know. Uh, and people who talk about PIDs will also talk about UFD, unique factorization domain, and even about ED. Euclidean domains. So one of the very important theorems in ring theory, it's trivial theorem, is that anything, we're going to prove it in a second, is that any, anything which is ED is PID. And the part which I'm not going to prove because I'm lazy and we don't need it in this journey, is that any PID is a UFD. So this is, I'm sure, like people like Tom, who took ring theory, remember. He might not remember proofs, but he clearly remembers because this is how you show that, you know, you strut around and you say PIDs and UFDs to demonstrate that you're a real mathematician. That happens junior year or some, some such thing. See? ED implies PID, right? Practically, before we see the proof, what does it mean? It means that, say, for integers, the canonical example of Euclidean domain, that's where Euclid algorithm sort of materialized, yes? That in integers, every ideal is a principal ideal, which is it's just the numbers divisible by something. There are no other ideals. It could be even numbers, or numbers divisible by 17, or numbers divisible by 385, whatever you like. But these are the only examples of ideals in integers. They're all generated by this one element. OK, so any ideal contains an element with a minimal positive norm. Why? Positive norm is what? An integer. Any set of positive integers has to contain minimal element. It's well-founded. It cannot be that there's just keep an ever-decreasing sequence of positive integers. So we find the smallest one, right? Then Everybody in this, inter, uh, 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 in this ideal equal A times otherwise, if it is not so, there will be some element A which is not exactly divisible. There is a remainder. And this remainder will have a smaller norm by the Euclidean axiom, right? 
So M is the principal element. And our ideal is the principal. I mean, it's actually very simple. We just say, find the minimal norm element, and that is going to generate a. Yes? Is the M always an integer? No, no, no. M is an element of the ideal. It, I mean, it, the only thing we know, it's some kind of Euclidean domain. It could be polynomials, univariate polynomial. It could be Gaussian integers. So, uh, okay. So, every Euclidean domain is a principal ideal domain. Now, we actually have a trivial proof of Bechet theorem. A linear combination ideal of a, a this A should be N. This is English grammar. And Euclidean domain contains GCD. Well, if we prove that if A is in, in the ideal and B is in the ideal, then the GCD, remember we proved that. Therefore, linear combination contains the GCD. So, and here we come to this amazing thing. We proved that these numbers exist, x and y. Yes? And they don't know what they are. So, for practical people, there comes this question, or actually the question comes even for very non-practical. Ivory Tower, as our friends there say, Ivory Tower people still wonder, is it really good to prove that something exists if we cannot construct it? What does it mean? And now the conventional mathematics, sadly enough, says, well, it's all right. It's just fine. We don't care whether we could construct it or not. I mean, we have this thing written down which sort of says that it exists. Now, let me tell you, it wasn't always like that. There were very great mathematicians, even like the other day, or historically speaking, the other day, who didn't believe it, who thought that unless you could somehow construct it, at least mentally construct it, it doesn't exist. It's just paper. It doesn't signify. And, uh, oh, okay. So, uh, I forgot this. I was, see, I, I apologize. So, remember, just push, push my words onto the stack. And let us look at this sort of invertibility lemma. So, if GCD of two integers are one, then there exists B such that A times B is one mod N. We proved it differently in the first journey. Now I'm just showing you how we prove it using this abstract algebra facts. By Bechet theorem, we know that we could get A and N with some B and D, right, to be equal to 1. Therefore, AB is equal 1 minus DN. And since this is 0, this is AB is equal 1 mod N. By the way, the fact that I said Z was just because I wanted to prove what we proved in the first journey. I could replace Z with any Euclidean domain. The proof will just work. So, as long as GCD is 1, you have invertibility. Right? It's a very, very important thing. And from that, sort of, you should be able to prove that any number less than prime and greater than zero is invertible mod p, which is that 
these are p, remainders, prime numbers, constitute a field. Right? We proved it in the first journey. But, okay, that should take three seconds again from the previous one. Well, just a hint. You have to rely on the fact that for any number between 0 and p, strictly between, GCD of that number and p is equal to, I'm not going to say what. You have to do it at home. Uh, so now we sort of get to this thing that there are non-constructive proofs. And it's, it's, a, it's a thing which for a while was a burning issue in mathematics. But then, as it often happens, people sort of, one of the parties win. It's not that they win an intellectual argument. It's just, you know, all the professors belong to, to the majority, minority is pushed away, and then people teach as if they ever won an argument. They never did. Sort of the fact that it still should bother a person remains a fact. But you never hear about it now because somehow the assumption is the battle is won. It was not won. So historically, there were two great sort of warring parties. And at that time, the battle takes place, roughly speaking, the year 1900. And the parties are well sort of aligned. Sort of one party is, let me, and all of you now know that I admire German professors, right? Especially from which university? Göttingen, right? You know, great people, great people. But they, at that point, constituted one of the warring parties. And they have, at that time, the great leader, David Hilbert, truly great mathematician. There is another party. And in my opinion, it had even greater leader. Sadly enough, he's not a party guy. He's just a very great guy. And his name is Henri Poincaré. And he's, of course, a Frenchman. And, you know, once upon a time, French people venerated their scientists and even put him on a stamp. Sadly enough, and this is something which breaks my heart, that July 7th, the year 2012, which happens to be about a month from now, it's going to be a 100-year anniversary of Poincaré's death. And there are no plans to do anything about it. No stamps, no celebrations, because they forgot. They don't know their mathematicians anymore. Right? And of course not here. If I wore Barack Obama, which I am not, and this is good. I, I like to be what I am. So I would address American people, say, we have to venerate even French scientists, even if they, you know, eat this freedom fries, we still want to venerate them. So he was indeed the greatest mathematician, in my opinion, of that time, and maybe the last several. I mean, it's clearly a magnificent figure. And again, I suspect that you might not even heard of him. This is a sad fact. Right. Sort of mathematicians heard of him. It's not that he's forgotten. But even mathematicians do not fully realize his greatness. And partially is, again, he is not a party man. And while many people claim to be Hilbert's disciples and are Hilbert's disciples, again, there are more people who claim to be his disciples that are truly his disciples, but there are no, Poincaré does not leave any students. I mean, he had like four students who he supervised, and none of them became significant, right? He has no time for, for things like that. Again, he is, again, sort of, let us, let us talk about him. He's so very great that I want to tell you about him. He is born in 1854. So he grows up in provincial town, Nancy, uh, and uh, sort of good student. Some people say brilliant, but it's not clear. Sort of, and grows up, and then when he is a sort of, 16-year-old kid, a terrible thing happens to his country. 
Again, it's forgotten now. Nobody remembers. But there is a terrible war in 1870 where France loses sort of terrible war with emerging, emerging Prussia, which right during this war becomes a German empire. Germany finally unites, and German empire is pro proclaimed where? Anybody knows? Versailles. The bastards not just defeat French, but they proclaim their empire in Versailles. I mean, there is a sort of. Uh, and I have no, while I love German professors, the German military is not my favorite, especially Prussian military. You know, I come from a country which lost 20 million people, so uh, we, we are not great admirers of German military. Again, German culture is another story altogether, let me be specific. And this emergence of Germany as a military power happens in 1870 with this terrible humiliation of France. Sort of, they defeat it, they proclaim the empire, and they take two large provinces of France away. They say that Alsace is German, uh, Lotharingia, as they say, Lorraine, is, 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 is German. And sort of, Poincaré sees all of that. He comes from a very deeply patriotic family and uh, greatly involved in French politics. I mean, how greatly? OK. His cousin, Raymond Poincaré, becomes three times the prime minister of France. At that time, prime minister is more important than president. This is the Third Republic. And during the Third Republic, president is a ceremonial position. By the way, for like six years, he also president of France. So he covers. So, you know, he comes from a very, like, you know, Gandhi in India. I mean, from a family which is deeply entrenched in sort of, and uh, in, in many respects, sort of, they grow under this idea of sort of German domination, a notion of revenge, sort of winning back. Is deeply ingrained. Uh, well, of course, then they win, and the other side gets a notion of revenge. And, you know, hopefully, by now it's settled. But uh, sort of, he grows up when the German imperial sort of power grows, and German mathematicians, whether they like it or not, remember, German professors are civil servants. They become imperial civil servants. And they clearly know that the German imperial mathematics is far greater than non-German. There is no racial undertone. For them, it's very clear that Jewish mathematician, if he speaks German, is a German mathematician. There is no, by the way, the interesting fact that in France at that time, every Jew is viewed as a German agent which is paradoxical if you think about it nowadays. But it was very clearly viewed that Jews are fundamentally pro-German and cannot be loyal to the French Republic. And some of you might have heard of the Dreyfus affair, sort of terrible, terrible injustice when a Jewish officer is sort of put in jail uh, for being a German spy. It was forged. I mean, he was totally innocent. And Poincaré, by the way, at that time, takes a very, very clear position that sort of evidence was scientifically, scientifically false. And he, he writes several papers. So Poincaré very quickly becomes this leader of French mathematics without being a leader. There is no party. And he's this absent-minded professor. He's a myopic, three glasses. So he doesn't see anything. He forgets everything. You know, if you invite him to a concert, he starts thinking about theorems. You talk to him during dinner, he starts thinking about theorems. Sort of, he's one of this, but he does amazing amount of stuff. He invents several areas, new areas of mathematics from scratch. You might have heard of topology. And algebraic topology, the real topology, was invented by Poincaré, just like that, from nothing. Great work. He is one of the last 
universal scientists, great work in celestial mechanics, maybe the last great work in celestial mechanics. It's done by him. He sort of proves the, it's a long story, but what I'm going to say is not technically correct, but I have no time to say technically. Proves stability of the solar system. He actually doesn't, but he, he sort of, and while doing it, he invents what we now call chaos theory, that he discovers that there could be tiny perturbations which lead to catastrophic, enormous results. Sort of, it was his idea. Does fantastic work in probability theory all over the place. And here yeah, I want to say the amazing fact, which you will gasp when I say it. He invents relativity theory. You say, no, 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 it cannot be. Well, I don't know whether it cannot be. I think it can be, because I think he did. This is, he publishes a bunch of papers. Again, he publishes 500 papers. You have to understand. This is men of prodigious productivity and very many books. And whole bunch of papers prior to Einstein papers where every single fact of relativity theory is clearly stated. Like absolute nature of uh, s uh, speed of light. You heard of formula E equal mc squared, yes? OK, Poincaré publishes a year and a half before Einstein paper, except he writes E over c squared is equal m. Well, even some of you might see that it's sort of close. He develops this thing called Lorentz transforms. And he names them after Lorentz with whom he corresponds. Lorentz, of course, says, well, I didn't invent, invent them. Poincaré did. Sort of all these things he does. But he does it in a bunch of papers. I don't want to diminish the greatness of Einstein. What I want to tell you is how great Poincaré was. Sort of is the fact that even today, historian of science sort of discuss there is this thing is, if you Google for special real relativity priority dispute. And you know, I actually read papers, I could tell you. He was not as articulate as Einstein because he spread it in multiple papers. He didn't do it as mathematically clean as Einstein. This is remarkable because he was a mathematician, not a physicist. He derived it from sort of physical, uh, from Maxwell equations, if you like. But he clearly knew it some of, I, I suspect, even five or six years before Einstein started thinking about it. He clearly had all of these ideas in his head. If you read his correspondence with Lawrence, it, it appears to be sort of self-evident. But again, he, he doesn't get credit, which is all right. So the question is, why doesn't he get credit? Because you see one of the things there is at that time, there is great rivalry between Germany and France. And Einstein is German. And sort of my friends in Göttingen do everything in their power to sort of undermine Poincaré across the board. Not just in this, because he is the main enemy. He is the enemy. And this is part of Einstein, I don't think, is even aware of that. Or maybe he is. I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain. But he doesn't get credit for, for that. And then he does another amazing thing, which sort of sets him utterly at, sort of, at war with Hilbert's party. He basically says, all talk about Non-constructive things, especially all talk about actual infinities, is just bogus. There are no infinite things. They just, you know, and all this Cantorian stuff will pass away as a nightmare. It's, and eventually I was trained in Hilbert's tradition. But at some age I actually realized, when I was old, I realized that, well, one can ever right. There are no infinite things, at least not in mathematics. We have, it's, it's just the potential infinity, yes, actual infinity now. So uh, 
conclusion of this thing, that a great tragedy of 20th century science is that everybody followed Hilbert, especially Bourbaki. This is a paradoxical thing. This is a French mathematician, yeah? Nicolas Bourbaki, named after General Charles Bourbaki, who, by the way, the most significant accomplishment was that he was the last French general fighting the Germans during the this 1870 1871 war. So, but these people, they named themselves after the general, but then they totally abandoned this tradition of Poincaré. And the tradition of Poincaré is, first of all, sort of, let me give you my interpretation, is that solid grounding of mathematics and physics. And second of all, what we would say nowadays, constructive computational mathematics. This is why I hope that Poincaré's legacy would be sort of rediscovered and his 500 papers and his books uh, would, be, would, be, would be studied and become, and this is why I'm telling you about him. So he was also a great writer. And a writer as a writer, not as mathematical writer. So much so that he became an immortal. Again, in France, you could become immortal. It's the only country where you could become immortal. How do you become immortal in France? We have this great institution called Académie Française, right? which was established by Cardinal Richelieu with the explicit mission of maintaining the purity of French language. So, and they do. They try. It gets harder now with all the new words, Harry Potter and stuff. And, uh, but he's elected as one of the members. And there are only 40. There cannot be more than 40 immortals. I mean, the world cannot take more. And to be elected, you're not elected as a member of the academy, actually. You're elected to the chair, sort of. There is chairs literally numbered from 1 to 40. And when one chair becomes empty, because the person who sits on it dies, you are elected to be a member. And uh, this, is, this is a great honor. In France, it used to be a great honor. Well, I don't know. Vincent, is it a great honor in France still, you think? OK. I'm happy to hear. But uh, you know, you get beautiful green and gold uniform for which you pay yourself. <laughs> I have a friend who is a member, so I know. And you inherit this chair, and you have this lineage. You could sort of say, oh, I sit in the chair of Poincaré, or I sit in the chair of Bossuet, or whatever. All these chairs had these previous owners. So you know your pedigree. So he becomes in. 1909, a member of the Academy because he's a great writer. His books are wonderful books on philosophy of science, philosophy of mathematics. They are translated into English. They don't read very well in English, so for lucky people who read French, I <laughs> recommend that you read them in French. For those who don't read them in English, they are great and very important books and very easily accessible. Well, I don't know what. I mean, they require a different level of understanding than, say, Harry Potter. But uh, most books worth reading require a greater level of understanding. They, they are remarkable. And sort of, this is something I just, the finally I want to conclude this part of the uh, lecture with a quote from Poincaré. And, Science with marvelous applications, but a science that would only have applications in mind would not be science anymore. It would be only cookery. Don't forget, he's French, so he knows cookery is very important. <laughs> you know, he's not putting cookery down, but he wants to say it's not science, guys. Sort of. And it is a very profound point. What is so very profound? You see, imagine that you search for something. If you say that you could visit only nodes, I am talking, which are practically useful, you might never find what you need, even what, what you're looking for is practically useful. You have to 
open the search to everything to get the, to the truth. And then you will get to practically useful results. Fight me from Poincaré to deny practically useful results. He spent years of his life, for example, working on practical thing called time zones. You know time zones? He invented them. That's not deep stuff. So he would work on practical things. But he remembered that you cannot, science cannot be restricted to practical things. You have to think about getting to the truth. And then practical things will come. Right? It's a paradoxical thing. A break and see you in eight minutes.